Hey everybody, it's Savage Lens News coming in this time with my friend and testing partner and Reinar player, Justin Salmon. Uh, we just got back from our Pro Tour weekend. Uh, both of us entering two different events. I hit the Pro Tour with Reinar and he hit the Calling with Reinar. And we both did pretty well, right? Wouldn't you say so? Yeah, can that yeah, I, that it's in that boat, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's in that boat. <laughs> well, yeah, we did did okay, I guess. Uh, I went seven uh, one in the pro tour in CC, and then I don't want to talk about draft. Uh, <laughs> and then Justin here went. Uh, what was it? Seven one day mm. one. Yeah, seven one day four. one. Continued to crush it day two, honestly, until just about the very end, where I uh, believe I watched you roll five ones in a row. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, in yeah, at about five or six rolls, it was like four or five ones. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. sometimes Reinhardt takes everything that you've ever loved away from you, I guess. Yeah. Um, so before we jump into the deck text, because I, we both brought basically the same deck. I think you made one or two tiny changes right towards the very end because you had an extra day of testing. And I think, you know, I complained about having one AB at one point, I believe. <laughs> so that, that was what made the change. Yeah. So, uh, basically the same deck and we both performed, I mean, for Reinar in one of the most difficult metas, in my opinion, pretty well. Before we jump into that though. How long have you been playing Flesh and Blood, my friend? Uh, I don't even I don't remember the date anymore. It was like uh, Crucible era, mm. um, like when Crucible was unobtainable, like only first edition Crucible. And oh, so wow. I didn't really play a ton because like we couldn't get the cards. I wanted to play Dash originally. And like at the time, oh, Chambers and Purifiers were like 40 bucks, 50 bucks a piece or something. Jeez. So I, w I waited until Monarch. Monarch was when I really started playing the game. And then I really liked Prism. And that was, you know, what set everything off. Yeah. You were a degenerate Prism player. So that is true. <laughs> I remember those days quite well. Um, so, so you kind of covered it already. Like you, you mostly played Prism, right? From basically Monarch until she was Living Legend, right? <clears throat> um, competitively, yes. Actually, I did play Lexi in there before Prism LL. Oh, yeah, you in did, yeah starvo chain meta um i in a game i like to play everything and so it helps know when you play against them as well yes. so you know i i own many most of the cards i've played every hero and and then during that time i like i said i played lexi for and won a pro quest i qualified for pro tour two with lexi um, oh, yeah, but yeah, yeah most yeah. prism was like my mainstay she she's the one i put the most hours on yeah so <laughs> My favorite question: Why would you pick Reinar for for the calling? One of the the uh, largest calling that we've ever had to date, I believe. So, well, it, you are the answer. <laughs> um, you know, you showed us what like people were missing in Reinar by spiking every North Pacific Northwest pro quest. Uh, just like you, you went to the finals or won every single one of them, or most of them. Maybe, maybe not like one of them because you conceded to one of our teammates. Yes, that's true. Uh, yep. And and like so, like obviously you were onto something with this like more tradey value list that just abused Blood Rush Bellow, and it makes sense. Like that that whole line of logic makes sense to me. And so like I couldn't ignore the the results, and I was like, I'll play this deck. I like. People don't expect you to play it that way and they don't expect you to get results with it. And that's like part of the advantage. But then also just like it just has the numbers. It just works. Yeah. That was, yeah. of course, before Lexi made a meteoric rise in the final hour where yeah. if she had been that popular beforehand, I may not have picked Reinar, but it worked out anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Lexi, man. Um, yeah. I mean, and all of the other heroes too, right? She was ninety something players in the Pro Tour. I don't, I, I don't, actually, I don't know if they've posted the calling percentages yet. I have to go see if they are there. But it, it wasn't a percentage. But I remember that the amount was lower. The percentage was lower in the calling than I expected it to be. Mm. Like out of nine hundred players, there was like a hundred and fifteen or hundred and thirty. It was somewhere in that ballpark of Lexi's. 
yeah. which is like, you know, I, I don't know. The calling was crazy because like the most popular deck to have that low of a number meant the field was just everything, just yeah. so many of everything. Yeah. Uh, but she was still the most represented deck in the calling. Yeah. Cause I mean, like we were talking about it, obviously leading up to the event and it was like, okay, Lexi is a terrible matchup, but we're one of the, I don't know, three decks that can randomly spike it. Right. Yeah. But everybody else who's popular, we have a pretty good game or pretty good shot into, right? Like old him, Dromai, Bravo, Dash, all of those kind of heroes. Reinhardt can beat those pretty reliably. So that was kind of why we were nervous about taking Reinhardt, but kind of yes. comfortable. Looking at the numbers, you know, you have you have Lexi, who's the most represented, but then you have old him and Dromai, which are almost as as represented they're not quite as but uh, close enough to basically call your good matchups double yes uh so you're like i'm aiming for two and three and just hoping to not hit enough of number one that i just like scrub out just by, by that matchup yeah exactly and then even if you I hit them right you're like you're forcing a coin flip is basically what we thought it was like just roll dice yeah exactly we you just abuse scabs and hope you see blood rush soon yeah. Okay. So you, I mean, so you took Reinar because you know it had a decent chance into a percent of the meta game. The main scary threat we could probably just force into kind of like a coin flip ish. You know, still probably very unfavored, but a coin flip. Um, and I believe we both ran into multiple Lexis. Uh, how many did you three, run into? Three in the calling. And how how many did you? How many games did you take? Two. I. All right. It, it was kind of like one because <clears throat> uh, one of them made a mistake and hit me with a heat seeker while he had another one cost arrow in his arsenal oh. and no um, snapdragons. Mm. And so his next turn, he started with two arrow. He, so his play was all, very clear. He was going to play one arrow. And I had blood rush and arsenal and blood rush in hand already. <laughs> so that, that was like the window. If he doesn't do that, he wins like hands down. I never get to fire two blood rushes. Um, so that was like my my lucky break there on the second Lexi. The first I lost round one to my first Lexi. Oof. And then there was that was my second Lexi round three, which was a t was was really close break. And then the third one I high rolled off of like out of the tournament. It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I only hit one Lexi and I ended up taking that one. And I too high rolled the absolute shit out of them. Uh <laughs> they also fell for some like, you know, tricks, right? It was like scabs into red barraging, which they blocked and then I see and see them. So, you know, it took two arsenals and still did damage uh because of intimidate. So it's it's got game, right? You can actually do some weird stuff. Like I would throw you can find like your way out of the match. Yeah. yeah I would throw in, like just a blue barraging like a high roller and and then a CNC just to see if they had a two block in their hand, you know, just like let, let's, you know, block it or don't. Right. Like, yeah. so yeah. it's kind of interesting. OK, so you you played Reinar in the event, um, ended up 33rd, which is a travesty. Uh, <laughs> and then, you know, I I went 77 and one and then absolutely punted draft. So. Not a winning list, but 32nd and a 900 and something player calling is absolutely wild because you had to play so much more CC than I did. Uh, you want to run us down like some of the other matchups that you hit? Name a hero. I hit it. Like, <laughs> that, which which was actually kind of the dream because like that's mm. what I liked about this Reinar deck is that it had like when played properly it has like a favorable win rate into everybody except for what ended up being lexi yeah. which is like before and before lexi like exploded i was so confident on the list because we were thinking azalea old him dromai yeah. right and it was like our playground and then lexi kind of like made it tar harder yeah but um yeah i played uh so like round one lexi round two azuri i think um which can be tricky, but um, I've yeah. started to get more comfortable in that matchup and just Same. trying to like not arsenal blood rushes and then like play a little more aggressively because our damage is higher. Um, and then I hit a Kano, I hit an old him, or oh, I ended up playing like three old hymns. But day one, I played one old him. A dash that I managed to fatigue after dealing seven to myself with Beast Within, Ooh. turn zero. Turn zero. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, gosh, who else did I play? I played in Azalea. I watched you spike a Briar. A Briar was the final round of the day. That was a sick game to watch. That game felt so good because like I had to play to the outs. Like there was no like I'm gonna get in the lead here. It was like these things need to happen. I need to play exactly this way to get there. And it, and like we got one to one, and I I got there. It was that was a really good game. Yeah, it was so cool watching <laughs> you play it. I because like I, again I don't really see other people play Reinar, especially not my exact list. So I'm like watching you play. Yeah. And you're picking your cards up, and I'm just like, oh fuck yes, like you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm all pumped because I've literally just never had anybody play the list like that. And every time you made a turn, you made a decision. I was like, this guy knows this guy's so good. <laughs> you know? uh, He's so good. Cause he plays like me. That was your- <laughs> yeah. a little bit of a humble brag, I guess, but like, no man, it was so sick to watch you spike a briar out of an event. It's so cool. Yeah. I was super stoked for that one. Cause I knew he flipped briar and I was like, Damn, I really wanted to end the day seven and one. And yeah, you know. I was like, this is gonna be something else. Um, and he he had a pretty lukewarm, like he didn't hit Mount Heroic super quick. He did have it on the final turns, but yeah, like it was just enough. Like I kept up enough, just barely enough damage, and then made a couple really key decisions that put it like right there and for my in my favor. That he was, killed cool one. he killed the Briar with Alpha Rampage, which so many Reinar players tell me is not good. That card is absolutely cracked on the right. Yeah, it, it's like, I mean, the double intimidate already puts it like three over what they could typically block, right? right. If, assuming they have two, three blocks. And then you throw anything else on top of that. Another intimidate, uh, barraging, um, you know, the damage, it just like, it just guarantees damage. It, it yeah. does a lot to finish games or just like push in damage when they're when they're trying not to take it. Yeah. Yeah, that was sick. It was such a cool run. I was uh, checking in every time I could. Oh man, it was so cool. So, so now that you you know you got thirty third in the world in the largest calling to date, and I I honestly I watched the second to last game against that old him who just literally had the right answer every single turn. It was kind and he of agreed. Ob- yeah, it was obnoxious. The guy <laughs> would draw like exactly the wrong card for the entire second half of the game. It was like, oh, you have a blood rush, cranial crush, no armor left. You know, it was like it was insane to watch. Um, but now that you've you've kind of performed this well, you know, in a in a massive event. Like, what's your next goal as a player? I, well, it's funny you say that because the very first calling ever in Vegas, I well, not the very first. There was other, you know, the first like big calling after COVID. Um, I placed like 14th or 18th on Prism, mm-hmm. and that was. Like I so that I was already there. I was one win away from top eighting, probably. And so I've all the whole my entire fab career goal has just been top eight a calling. <laughs> oh, you're always like, one away. <laughs> I, it's so so tragically close all the time, and I I just find myself not getting there. Um, yeah. On different heroes there, too. Yeah, I mean the Reinar. Like I keep going back to those two olden matches I lost in the end of the calling, and like. I could have like I could have made other decisions that didn't get me there. But like with the with the gambler's gloves, you figure you're not going to hit a one and th- you're like you're like I can't hit the one in 36 right now. And then yeah. you do it and you're like, should have just played the card. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah. I mean, I didn't want to yeah w- hit on you right after that loss, too. But I mean, I think it's just that I've been playing around it forever. Right. So that stuff does happen and that's why you know those of you guys out there right like if you're winning you don't have to roll you only roll like unless like when you need to you know like lexi you kind of have to so i think i think if you had been playing the deck for like just long enough to experience a quadra one (laughs) you probably would have won that game but that was legit your first quadra run one you know like that was your first double one right the game before yeah yeah Yeah. so i think that was just the timing right you know i think well you you're the one that told me you to roll on blood rush turns against old him so you you roll before you blood rush yeah 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 i know yeah you roll before you blood rush that turn in particular like i took a bunch of damage to do that blood rush turn so i was like even if i roll before i play the blood rush and i hit the double like i'm i lose anyway like the whole the point is i don't do he's like so far ahead in health because i miss 
mm. that like I, you know, the next blood rush, it won't even catch me up or like okay. reckless won't get me out. That was like me, you know, I don't know. There's maybe a lot of ways like I could have played slower. I could have blocked a lot more damage. Maybe yeah. I did have like I did remembrance in I remember it's pretty early and got like one blood rush back in and two swing bigs. And maybe I should have just like waited for second cycle. But like, I don't know how aggressive they're going to be and how much health yeah. I'm going to end up losing accidentally, which turned out yeah. to be a lot. He kept playing Paris <laughs> under and it yeah. was a lot of damage. I mean, yeah. So I think this brings up an interesting kind of topic. So I'm going to be talking about this topic with some other people coming on the channel, particularly like that, that dot, the dash player who ended up winning it. Right. But mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of merit in for in this game in particular of one tricking, right? Because you you mentioned a couple things like right there it's like i don't know how fast he can go i don't know how much damage i can take i don't know how long i can hold you know like so i think i really do think in this game in particular it's proven that one tricking is at least very helpful over the course of like a 15 game tournament you know what i mean yeah and i i actually talked with the uh talked to chris ray about this briefly at the calling um Cause he, he, we were talking a bit and he was like, I need to just, I'm going to pick a hero in this, out of this next set. And I'm just going to play that. And, and I, to, there is a lot of merit to that. Um, when I played prism, I played prism at times when she was very bad. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I played her in pro tour too, which not, she wasn't necessarily bad, but like Briar was huge. Briar won. Briar was a bad, bad matchup, especially yeah. if the people figured out prisms, you know, for how to play optimally against prism um but like i knew that deck i put in so many hours in online armories during covid with prism like i don't have the experience on any other hero that i do prism like just know every hand was like i know i already know what to do with this hand i already know every possible outcome for when when my opponent attacks me what i'm gonna block with first what i'm gonna mm -hmm. if i'm gonna just get, if this hand is worth eating the entire like there is so much value in knowing your deck like having hundreds of hours on a deck it yeah and like you can you can look at the data and the matchup spreads as much as you want and and i do it a lot where i'm like you know if a player it, you know i feel like i'm going to run into players playing perfectly i'm going to hit the my bad matchup they're going to play it perfectly and then I, you know like i have no i have zero percent chance to win that matchup but in reality not many players play perfectly even yeah. at top tables even in the finals um and so like the reality is always way different than the practice or the theoretical practice. Um, just thinking about matchups and stuff. You will, if you take your deck and you pilot it perfectly, you will still win matchups that you should not have yeah. because they make a mistake or they play suboptimally or they built their deck suboptimally or whatever it is. But you're there, you're super comfortable, you're focused, you know exactly what every hand does. It's like there's so much value in that. Yeah. I mean, the amount, it kind of blew my mind because this was my first ever premiere event, I guess, right? Like this is the the Pro Tour. It was the biggest event I've ever been to, right? The only one, this is the first one I've qualified for as a player coming in relatively recently. The amount of mistakes I witnessed was mind-blowing, right? And yeah. I do think a lot of it comes from people switching to new decks because the, the meta shifted. And so they had to go to their Azalea, they had to go to their Lexi, they had to go to Oldham, they had to go to Dromai, right? And totally. they pick one of those four heroes and they kind of try and jump in. And then, you know, like you said, I I would draw my four cards and I'd be like, here's plan A, B, C, mm -hmm. right? And then they would do something and I'd watch them make a mistake and I would capitalize, you know, like, like the barraging into the Lexi, right? I did mm -hmm. like a just a play that I was hoping that they might fall for. They fell for it. And then I absolutely rolled them from that point in the game. It was literally turn two. And I was like, I win. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. it was nuts. Um, so yeah, I think, I think those of you out there, you little, little baby Reinar players who are worried that the meta is too much. Right. Uh, I, I mean, I think you can do it right. I think you have to get immaculate at your deck though. Right. You can't, you can't play a bad deck and make mistakes. You kind of have to pick one. <laughs> uh <laughs> you know okay cool so do you want to you want to jump into the list now and we can talk about like um um the card choices and maybe some some matchups and stuff like that that sound good sure yeah all right let's do it okay so here we are with the uh, basically the unified list i'll put both in the description below uh the only real difference is 
I really didn't believe I was going to run into any wizards, so I took out AB. Uh, I just had Nilrun Hood, took out the AB helmet and the AB gloves. Uh, and then I ran into a wizard day one, and I told Justin all about how terrifying it was. Mm-hmm. So he added in, you know, the standard equipment set with Nilrun gloves and the AB2 helmet, right? So that's the only difference between the two lists that we, we did was that change. Uh, somehow... I did take two Icelanders down with just no rune hood, both of which I lost the die roll for. So I ate damage turn one and I still took him down. Granted, I don't recommend it because the second Icelander, I basically was like, if you have it, you got it. You know, like I went down to two and I was like, you better hope you draw an uh, arcane spell because I'm either going to kill you or you're going to kill me right now. And they didn't <laughs> draw an arcane spell and I killed them. <laughs> so... It was, uh, I wouldn't recommend it. It was kind of on the wild side, but uh, we're looking at the standard equipment seat suite, right? Crown of Providence, Fendals, Gambler's Gloves, Heart and Cross Strap, Claws, No Clubs, or Meat Axes in this list, Arcane, and then Scabskins. Um, Justin, I mean, what was your opinion this time around between Heart and Cross Strap and Fendal Spring Tunic? Because I think last season I was really high on Cross Strap. But I did shift a little bit more back towards Fendals because of the amount of times we're rolling gamblers gloves or we're, we're rolling scabskins this time. So what was your opinion on that? Um, so I was a little bit worried about heart and cross strap. I I was still just getting used to the sideboard and like what I'm supposed to use it for, and I kept imagining that like I would use it to, against like you know Briar, our super our bad matchups that we need that for the, to go yeah. fast or to equalize kept imagining a, as a big combo turn where you'd like blood rush and attack and then like you get you get the claws in and you'd also crack the chest and get another attack in or something yeah. that's not really what ends up happening that's like that's like really really high roll because you have to roll scabs as well yeah. if you're going to attack twice or or you can use it to bail yourself out if you draw a fistful of reds and you just can't actually play your blood rush turn but what I what I used that for, I think I used it three times. No, I played it against every Lexi. And that was a decision I made myself last minute was to instead of tunic go cross strap because the matchup was so tight. Mm-hmm. And then I used it against Briar and yep. Viscerai. I think I used it five times. And every single time I used it, it was to play a one card hand after blocking. Yeah. And that was that was just to like survive until blood rush came but also i get to send um you know eight i get to swing big them for like with a one card hand yeah so it's like it makes a good damage trade they usually eat it and then you're that much closer to blood rush equalizing the match for you or winning it for you Mm -hmm. um i used it once to do like command and conquer against one of my i think it was the briar and he found it very annoying so it was, <laughs> it's yeah. just a useful like i was worried because sometimes the matches on talishar would go longer after i popped it like way longer like i'd have to start blocking like my the blood rushes just weren't coming and i was like man tunic would have been like so much more valuable in this match but when it's like when it's tight and you're in the live event i heart, heart and cross strap felt good it felt like i needed that because when my opponents were like they were constantly pushing the game towards the end. And I needed that out of like, you're going to take eight here and now you're softened up enough where I actually can win this game. Yeah. That was mostly how I used it during like my pro quest run, right? Like every aggro matchup, I just put it in and it was almost always what you said, like block nine, swing eight, block nine, swing C and C block nine, swing a race face, like whatever it was to just give me a free turn. Cause you know that's 17 points of value if you use that on a swing big like that's a pretty fat turn if you block nine swing eight like that's a very actually that's actually very above rate right um and my opponents do find it annoying right if you <laughs> so i put yeah. like an erase face on my arsenal against dash and i'd block 12 swing erase face like you know how annoying that is <laughs> so, <laughs> you, know, you know how annoying that is to block 12 and still have an on hit um yeah yeah I think the only reason I shifted a tiny bit, because like I said before, I was 100% on cross strap, and then I started kind of wiggling back towards Tunic, was that in this matchup, I do roll a lot more, or this game, uh, this season, I'm rolling a lot more than I did last season. And so the one break point does let you do certain things, like uh, hold a blue, hold a six, and have a two cost in Arsenal. So like two two cost sixes. 
And every time tunic is up, you can roll for the blue six, six tunic, you know, mm. uh, which does add up over time, but you have to be in a game that lasts long enough for you to see tunic twice. And Lexi t- doesn't let you live that long, you know? So, yeah. yeah. But yeah, most other matchups, the tunic felt feels good. Though. I mean, your, yeah. your rune blades and your Lexi are too fast, but every other matchup, I, you know, I would much prefer Tunic to make those kinds of plays. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Um, all right. So I, and I guess in the details too, we, you know, Crown of Providence, right? Um, how often did you use Crown of Providence aggressively to fix a Blood Rush turn? Because no. I think I'm pretty notorious for doing that. I, I'll just throw Crown and I'll try and find a blue. I think just by chance... I never had to use, like my blood rushes always looked good enough or my hand was so bad that I just couldn't blood rush sank the arsenal or played the, or like just played the arsenal and, and arsenal the blood rush. Like I never felt like I was in a position where I should like try to fix a blood rush hand with it. Okay. Um, I always used it to play around command and conquer or just desperately blocking on hits from like Ranger. Right. Yeah. Um, and the old him, it would be like, yeah, here comes Command and Conquer Pummel, so I'm gonna get the arsenal out of here. That was pretty much I pretty much used it for like your normal use cases. Okay. Yeah, I have a lot of I mean, I don't do it all the time. It's definitely matchup dependent. But like the dash threw an eight at me and I looked at him and I just said block with crown and he was kind of so confused. But it was like I just needed to get a red out of my hand so I could blood rush him mm-hmm. into the floor. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. um okay. All right, the core package, which it used to be 38 with a sh- with a lot of sideboard slots. And now <laughs> we weren't, I don't think me and you were done really building the sideboard because we were going up to the last day making changes. Yeah. So there, this list is going to be refined for sure. Because right now I think there, there's a, too many attacks possibly because a lot of the time I was kind of questioning what attacks I want in and out. And some of them overlap, like mostly skull crack and enlightened strike, I think really overlap with each other. But the core package for me stayed basically identical to last season. The only difference is being sand sketch plan, uh, which I didn't play once. What about you? Um, no, yeah, no, yeah. I never found an opportunity to play it. I think I played not it that once I in a not that I think year. it's like useless or bad. I like I've had plenty of really awesome plays in practice where it, it like made made things happen i mean and then we also did cut down to two so it's in your hand less often yeah but yeah it's just like every time it was there i mean that's what it's versatile right it's a blue block three and then if you end up with it in hand and a bunch of sixes and like you don't have to risk rolling scabs like i pretty much only use it if i've got like multiple beasts within in my hand or like a beast within and a skull crack i'll go get another beast within and then yeah. you can make something happen or like but yeah, two savage feasts like yeah you have one, it, go get oh, yeah one. exactly um it's not a card i found like i think you should be playing a lot i think it's just a a really great option for a blue block three that is going to like sometimes make really great plays yeah but you, you really are, need it to go card pot. Like you need it to replace or gain resources because like using it just for an action point is really inefficient. Especially because we have so, like, okay. So we had 17 blues. Uh, just so everybody knows, I always run 17. I'm on the lower side of claws list, to be honest. I think most claws players are sitting at like 20, 21, but I like to sit at 17. Did you, did you notice problems with blue ratios or no, I think it's, I honestly think it's perfect. Um, yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> almost, almost never find myself. It's, it's only when you draw two random cards off of blood rushes when you're like, damn, my resources are really bad right now. Cause like yeah. you, at, you discarded the, um, what's it called? The wrecker rom- every, yeah. time. every time, every time, every time, every time wrecker roms gets discarded, dude, every time <laughs> it's not, it's, it makes no sense. But normally, like, pitching a blue and drawing at least a yellow, and especially if you have Tunic up, is, like, perfect for the Blood Rush turn. Yep. But, like, yeah, the I on every turn that's not Blood Rush, I felt there's enough blues. I can, like, block with cards and save it and do Tunic, two claws, like, or just send an, a three-cost attack. It it felt fine, honestly. I didn't, I've never found myself going, we should try to fit more blues in here. 
Okay, cool. And so for everybody at home who doesn't understand why there's some... Because the blues in this deck, they're 17. They never come out. They're always there, right? Uh, basically, the, the idea behind the blues was that they all serve a very unique purpose in the second cycle, right? I mean, Wrecker Romp is there for Reckless Swing, and it's just a blue block six. Like, that's that's our best blue. Reckless Swing is going to win you a game, guaranteed. And then every one of these other cards, ex except for the addition of Sand Sketch Plan, say Intimidate on it. So basically, every time you're pitching a blue card down, the second cycle against, like, decks that actually make you play long, like Old Him, every one of your cards becomes an Intimidate target. So you can go Remembrance back a, an Alpha Rampage and you have Barraging Blues, Clearing Bellow Blues, High Roller Blues, and a Pack Hunt floating around your deck to end the game in one big hit, right? So that's kind of the idea behind all of the blues. Um, yellows, right? I mean, Smash Instinct, Riled Up, and Reincarnate. I don't think you... There's nothing special about those, right? Like, they're just... Nah, I think they're just the best yellow six options. Um, yeah. I mean, Reincarnate's effect is, like, really insignificant for the most part, but it's it's something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Wild Up gets plus one, which has been relevant. Um, and Smash Instinct, just throwing six with an Intimidate is great sometimes. You make things awkward for your opponent. Yeah, Reincarnate only really comes around if it's, like, a hyper fatigue old him who got you on a couple turns and it's like wow i really need a six in my deck for reckless swing and and that one comes back around or something but yeah Re riled up is probably riled up and smash instinct are better than they seem but they're still bad <clears throat> yeah. yeah i mean i'm not looking to like <laughs> they're not my primary choices for attacks but you know they're they're fine when i need to use them they're okay yeah, I mean, Blood Rush Bellows, this is a Blood Rush Bellows deck. That is what it does. It does nothing else aside from <laughs> Blood Rush Bellows to the maximum extent you can. So obviously that card is important. And then Beast Within, which I hated last season, has performed very well this season. What's your take on Beast Within? It's also performed very well for me, except, man, I've, I've never hit so many misses like... In the calling, I hit a massive amount, yeah. As opposed to in our testing, where I felt really good with it, but like, like I said, that dash turn zero, I made a play to like triple intimidate and end on an arsenal, and I so I beast with it, and I took seven damage, and then he's boost dash, and so I'm starting to fatigue with seven less life. I ended up just barely getting there, but holy crap, that was stressful. And then I think one of my old M games, I took like five on one of the triggers, yeah, which. But sometimes you just, you hit one and you're like, that was amazing. I turned my Savage Feast turn just became its own Blood Rush Bellow. Yep. And like you kill your opponent. So yeah. it's like. First cycle, definitely. I mean, it's hard to tell because like last season I was running almost always 30. So it was, it was, it's supposed to average like, what, like 1.5 to two cards flipped. But I hit seven and eight and five <laughs> and and so last season i was really not about it but actually we kind of upped the six count this time around and it felt way better with 36 sixes like beast within against dromai is absolute gas mm -hmm. but beast within against old him absolutely terrible in my opinion yeah you, you i think you just really have to know when mm -hmm. is appropriate to trigger it um because, yeah, some matchups you will take damage you don't need to be taking and lose cards you don't need to be losing. And you could, you would have won like if you had just played your other cards. Yeah. And in some matchups, you need that high roll where you just like, I need to hit this and I need an extra card. And like, I, I can remember two games uh, at least where like I had it in my hand and I was like, I can't really force it, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to do my thing. I put the cards down, my opponent rolls for it, they hit it both times. And it just like turned into a 25 damage blood rush turn or a savage feast turn and just murdered my opponent. Yeah, I drew I drew C and C against Azalea off of Beast Within Trigger, off of a Savage Feast, and I and then I drew off the Savage Feast a swing big, and I was like, You're dead. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> the, uh the uh the Azalea that top aided, I played him round one of day two, and he was undefeated at the time. And I hit I did a blood rush. With two CNCs and a beast within in my hand. Oh my god! And he, he did. Uh, he picked the he picked the beast within, 
got like I'm like sitting on like a five card hand, and two of them are two of the cards are CNC. I roll, I hit the four on the dice. Oh. I do all my I go I get to do like claw, an attack with intimidate, the other claw, and then I CNC him and blow up both of his arsenals. And like that was the game. It was now like seventeen to five, and he had no arsenal and like and no cards. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and like I couldn't have done as much damage, like nearly as much damage as I did without the beast within getting me extra cards and targets and stuff. Yeah, I think against Ranger, it's one of the most cracked cards we have, especially because we're kind of leaning really heavy on sixes and stuff. Where you know, like I don't know. Uh, good. And then Savage Feast, we talked about this accidentally. Savage Feast is the strongest non Blood Rush card in the deck, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You you roll for cards this most of the time. Yeah, the card makes plays. The card makes game winning plays. Honestly, mm -hmm. so much pressure out of nowhere with yeah. this thing, because like even if you if you just hit a four, you can you can go like, a like okay, a scenario where you have like a whole hand for for whatever reason, and you hit the four, and you go savage feast claw claw another attack like a two for six or two for eight is like so much damage without blood rush that your opponent is blocking and yep. taking unblockable damage. And then you then you're just like, well, that wasn't even blood rush. How about I draw a blood rush now? And now you're actually dead. Yeah. Like, yeah. This this card just puts up so much. It can also be awkward, but it's for the most part just like Yeah, a, a lot of the time it can be awkward. Like if you have no blue, if you have because there are a couple of times I got stuck with like blue, Savage Feast, E Strike, something else, or I don't know, like a card that I couldn't really play. And I was like, wow, none of these cards are literally playable. So that's like a roll for scabs. There was no E Strike. I don't know. It was like a bunch of unplayable cards and it was like i guess i'm rolling for scabs to you know claw into a savage feast no draw i don't know you know yeah yeah but when this card hits like you said like if you get a savage feast claw claw attack that's 20 damage 18 to 20 damage that's a blood rush turn you know yeah with an intimidate so they're forced to block with like whatever is left i don't know really good um, one other thing about that card, don't underestimate that it draws. Like I used that to dig and that won Absolutely. me the Briar game. That mm -hmm. got me one card deeper and then I drew my next hand and the fourth card I drew was Blood Rush Bellow. Like yeah. this card is just more dig to get you to your other power card. Sometimes I'll tunic and play this with just a two card hand just to get like a one card deeper and put that card in my arsenal. I do that all the time. I think that's a really good point. So if you so a lot of the brutes would say like when I was talking about this card they, they didn't really love it because they're like it's you need to it's a fifty percent chance to fire right with a chance to end your turn, but when it doesn't fire, if you do not have an arsenal, this card is not negative because like every other discard card in the game is like you're losing three value, but this one you're losing the three value getting it back and you can stick it in your arsenal. I mean unless you hit a blue wrecker rump, which is absolute travesty, but. <laughs> As long as you don't hit a blue wrecker romp or like a sand sketch plan, the card is neutral on the discard. So it's not as bad as it seems when you miss. Um, and I think speaking of, I think one thing I missed on gambler's gloves, this has been the first season I have aggressively used gambler's, gambler's gloves on rolls. Like I think one of the reasons I beat the Azalea, my, my fourth round or whatever was I missed I had a blue beast within and savage feast. I missed. I hit like a two. I went for the roll. I popped them and I was like, let's see what happens. You just, you just win. Like if yeah. you hit the two action points, you're going to just win on the and spot. I, yeah. I rolled a six and I absolutely annihilated them. Like it was gross. It was like savage feast swing, big CNC or something along those lines. And it was like, okay, you know, GG, right? <laughs> okay. So then the sideboard, we can dive into it a little bit. Um, Alpha Rampage and Barraging Beatdown, you know, uh, Ryanar's kind of core identity. I think Alpha Rampage for me is just such a strong performer in this meta. Like maybe not against Lexi, but it's free damage if you lose the die roll and win the die roll. Depends. A lot of people will make you go second because you're Reinar, but a lot of people will still make you go first and alpha rampage barraging beatdowns just 13 damage turn one you know uh what were your and then uh, barraging for me red barraging ex, ex, like is two for seven on a claw which is above rate sometimes you just do that to get cards from your opponent too you're just like, exactly. are you gonna take seven from this measly play like 
And yeah. a lot of like the more aggressive decks will take it. I had people take seven from Barrage and Claw. Yeah. Like, oh, the two right. card seven that has multi purpose, right? Barraging Beatdown is a multi purpose card. It either does seven or it annihilates you later. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, so I, I, I don't know. Did you have any any opinions on Barrage and Beatdown Alpha Rampage? I just pretty much consider these cards main board at this point. Too, I could yeah. I could see when I actually I don't know if I can see. <laughs> I I couldn't really understand when they came out because they're just so universally good. But I yeah. Alpha can be Alpha can be awkward in like matches where you just need your hands to fire and like you know push reasonable damage you're looking like your your aggro matches your rune blades you, even though this this did literally end the game versus the briar it's like mid game you're like do i really play an alpha rampage it's so many cards to commit to nine damage mm -hmm. if you if that's like your whole play so you don't really want to do that which kind of makes it a dead card sometimes so i understand the skepticism on it but it also just ends games and like you said turn zero can get some damage in so it's a good card it's really hard for me to like say that this goes to the sideboard at any time yeah i only really took it out this season late against lexi and it was because i had so many other attacks in that i didn't really find the room for alpha rampage but if they ever forced me to go first this card's in like 100 sure. percent. yeah because i'm just gonna i you know like like we were talking about against lexi anything i have to win if that means i have to do free damage on turn one i'm gonna try yeah um but yeah barraging beatdown surprisingly like you said one of our best anti-aggro tools because like phi viscerai briar they look at seven they're like i don't want to give you two cards like viscerai can't give you two cards most of the time he's a three card deck so when you say seven they just kind of eat it you know and it's yeah just i think there's also there, at least for me i felt it when you used to play when I play whatever into your Reinhardt and you do a claw for seven, there's a mental thing where you, you look at it and you go, okay, I block with two cards and it turns this off. And then, but at the end of the combat chain, you look at your two cards, just blocking a claw for three because it yeah. turns it off. And I'm like, I, I feel like that's wrong. Like I feel like I shouldn't be giving two cards to this claw. I think it's like a weird trap. It's like, I win both ways is how I personally feel about that card. It's like, if you take seven, yeah. you're an idiot. But if you give me two cards, you're an idiot. Cause now I can find a blood rush. That's a Kano thing. That's like Kano yeah. does that too. Where he's like, you gave me two, like you AB5, like, okay, that's sick. I'm just waiting for, you know, my big pieces. Yeah. It honestly is how it feels. It, it feels like a, I feel, I don't know. That's probably why I run that card in almost every matchup. It's like, it feels like I win no matter what. Honestly, Red Barraging is probably a main board card at this point in time. I don't know if I have a matchup I take this out on anymore. Uh, but it's, okay, like, it's, I like, it's a zero for four block three and it ends games it gets early damage it, it does a lot it's yeah I, yeah uh cadaverous contraband did you run into a drone mine i played zero drone mines. mines all right when, i when forgot i put this in the list because this was a last minute change uh I, you know like we were like like i said this is not a finished list i it's very unrefined there's too many attacks there's too much stuff going on I had one weird spot left and I was like, you know what? There's going to be so many Dromai's. Why not have like one tech card for Dromai? And I forgot it was in my list. I played my first Dromai. It had three blood rushes and he had like five or 10 or something like that health left. And I was like, huh, I didn't put remembrance in like, what am I going to do? And then I drew cadaverous contraband and I was like, oh, I'm going to win. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was legit. Like the, I had so both Dromai players had to read the card because they didn't believe me. And so I spiked <laughs> his dragon. I put a blood rush on top of my deck and the, the disappointment in them in the person's face was like palpable. <laughs> it That's was so good. It was gross. And then the second Dromai, uh, you know, I beat him before I got to play it, but like he was kind of, you know, he's he was a really high ranked Dromai player. Like he's playing the big dragon deck, one of the makers of the deck or whatever. And so he was like, yeah, you know, if only I could have made it to Remembrance. And I was like, yeah, you know, I had a Cadaver's Contraband, like, in Arsenal. You were, I was going to I was gonna Blood Rush you, like, in two turns, <laughs> you know? And he was like, no, it doesn't work, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, he's like, no, I could block it. I have D-Reacts or whatever. I was like, I wouldn't send it at you. <laughs> like, I'm going to send it. I'm going to pop an Ash Wing with it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. I don't care yeah. this dragon. And he had to read it, too. And I was so... 
Cadaver's Contraband, if you have drum eyes in your local game store and you want to make them miserable, run this card. Uh, that's, that's a great, great setup, setup too, because you can, like, when you do that, it goes on top of your deck, but you can just arsenal and attack. And so, like, mm -hmm. your Blood Rush could just be, like, the nuts. At, yeah, you, you hold, know, you just hold one extra card, like a swing big, put it in arsenal, and you've just built the perfect Blood Rush turn, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, Command and Conquer, I don't really think needs much. It's a Ranger meta, you know? Yeah. <laughs> This play like one it. art. It's the only card we have that has text on it when you play against the ranger. Um, e strike. This was super late edition. In fact, I think I have like, I went into the pro tour with like three games of e strike practice. <laughs> I think it's more than that. You were talking about it a few days before we we flew out. Yeah, You're but you were the one playing it, and I was just listening to you, and I tried it on Talishar. I think the, I took it to my oh, very I took it to my armory. I, and I oh, played okay. against our local Lexi player, Archer, and I think I did a 29 damage blood rush thanks to E-Strike. And then I texted you on Discord, and I was like, E-Strike is cracked. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah E-Strike is very interesting. Um, it's it's not a, it's one shy of six, which, like, can be awkward, but it's pretty rare because it's such yeah. a versatile card. When you get a hand where you're like, I wish this was a six, you're like, oh, but wait, it's E-Strike. So this is just going to come in for seven, or I'm going to do go again, or I'm going to roll scabs and do draw a card. Like, it it works very well with the way that this deck plays. It can open up a lot of, like, surprising lines. Yeah, the draw card, too, really blew. I think the first time I did the draw card when I, it was when it, like, kind of clicked. It was like, wait, like, we're the only class that can make this a zero for five without like i don't know creepers or something and it does what the original core concept of the deck was was to dig for its blood rush right it's like it's why you play fate for scenes and sink blows it's why you do all that stuff like to dig for your blood rush as fast as possible it's what savage feast is for right you're digging for blood rush and this card as soon as i started realizing it's a zero for five fine blood rush card <laughs> uh it was like really good you know and then when it ever when all else fails it's a you know it's a two for seven yeah um, the one awkward thing with it is like you don't really want to do five draw a card off an empty hand because there's a lot of things you don't want to put in your arsenal yeah you, you like you said earlier wrecker romp and and sand sketch and a couple of things could get really awkward but like just sending seven is great it like it's the barraging thing right you just send seven and say do you want to take this i just blocked six or nine or whatever yeah give me two cards or don't either way it's cool um to go again two came up more often than i thought it would so like one of the awkward things about not when your opponent's at three life or less but when they're at like seven or eight where you're not quite like locking them in the blocking phase they still have a little bit of health to give I noticed that like I would roll for scabs i wouldn't quite get what i wanted but e-strike would be like five go again into six which is way more than you can threaten with any other card in this list on a non blood rush turn and a non like or a non scabs turn yeah um this card also i think won me i think it won me at least one game and it's it's been my target multiple times in practice against codex of frailty where it's, i'm already ahead if i'm ahead and their codex is not command and conquer or some you know hand destruction or arsenal destruction I will go like put the E strike in and then I'm gonna go E strike go again into swing big. And like they've given me the flexibility to like put them in the spot where they're gonna lose. It's it's not super common, but that is a something you can use it for. The go again is is very relevant without so you don't you don't have to like lose off of rolling scabs. Yeah, I actually did I actually put an E strike in my arsenal too and just waited. Because like they they were behind, I think. And so like the codex was just going to cost me a card and I, you know, they'd send like a, whatever arrow they could summon, but like I'd ripped too many cards last turn. So I just stuck an E strike in there and I was like, cool. My next turn is going to be like bigger, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Um, D reacts, right? We, we have the one fate for scene, the three sink belows. We went up to six fates and sinks. And then we went back down because, uh, you know, the most I'd ever played with was four. And when we went up to six plus like these extra cards, it felt clunky. Like, what was your thoughts on the four? Four is like, 
four might even it's sometimes too much when you're when you're in the lead and you're being the aggressor four is too much like you just hit these turns where you're like i can't do anything but i mean it's you know they they serve a purpose and sometimes it's just like that but six was obviously way too much um yeah because it wasn't just six it was six with three sigils and you know most of the time a tome and also all these yeah all these blue non-attacks there was just so much to make your blood rush not fire or make it awkward to use a discard card it was just too much like it the core pieces of Reinar didn't work with that many non six cards and non attack cards. Um, so yeah, it, four is like right on the line of like, you could cut the fate if it was your personal preference and you'd probably be right to do so, but you're also fine running it because it looks, it, you know, it goes down a card. It's just a little more, it's a good trading card. So yeah. Yeah. It's a weird line to balance because like you said, like you're trying to make the core concept of the deck, which is to blood rush really well work. Uh, and those ruin blood rush turns, but they also fulfill the weird purpose of like finding blood rush. You know, fate is a block four that digs one sink is a block four that digs one. And like when I block with those cards, it almost does not matter what the top card of my deck is. It's going to the bottom unless it says blood rush bellows. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the only the only exceptions is like maybe if I'm in an aggro matchup and it's another fate on top or another sink on top or like yeah. arg smash in the dash or like a CNC into a ranger. But if it if it's not one of those cards straight to the bottom, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if it would be nice to see it next turn. It's not as it's not as blood rush bellows. It's going to the bottom. Uh, so it's kind of hard to balance those ones. Uh, yeah, it just is what it is. Like those yeah. cards are just a necessary evil. <laughs> yeah necessary evil if Reiner had better cards i would take him out but he doesn't uh humble i think it's my 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 lowest performing card of the weekend probably yeah i think it's um it's okay i don't i don't think it's trash i think the idea is sound i just think that lexi has way too much play around it around everything really um i hit a lexi with it like i he was kind of mid-ish all going into the late game like he's gonna end me soon or i'm gonna find blood rush and i might have even cracked the chest for it i don't know but i sent this at him he has one card face down in arsenal and he just takes it. he goes okay i'll take six and guess what the card in his arsenal is it's falcon wing it doesn't matter you you can't punish this deck premeditate it could be it could be premeditated it could be codex it could be falcon yeah. wing it could it could be um you know bolt and shot and they could draw a pump like so any number of things you can punish them and that was the reason we put it in mm-hmm. was because like there were no better cards there are no on hits we can choose that are going to help us and we needed something to fill the deck and this is like that microscopic chance that you brick alexi or you threaten to brick them so they block yeah, but it's just like almost never happens, and so it was a really disappointing tech card. Yeah, it was it was all for the high roll, right? Like the same thing with yeah. the e strikes, the same thing with the savage feast, the same thing with the skull cracks. What we're gonna talk about in a minute. It was like, what can we shove in here to, to possibly give us a tiny edge? You know, and and humble was one of those cards that was like mm, sometimes it does something. Like I did the Lexi I sent this against blocked it because it did happen to hit a turn where they were going to be super bricked. Like it was a double arsenal. They probably couldn't get rid of the flip card or whatever. It was just, you know, whatever. Um, so it did work in that one, but yeah, more, more often than not useless. However, this card absolutely slaps Dromai and it absolutely slaps Azuri. Yeah. It, that was another reason to include it was that, yeah, it, it has a pretty decent range of people that it affects. Oh, and it hits Briar too. Another decent one. No embodiments of lightning or earth for you. Yeah. Okay. Pack Hunt. Uh, it says Intimidate on it, and it's a two for six. I think that's really the... Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's actually amazing. Like, this card feels very good to play. Two for six that doesn't discard but has Intimidate is very premium, I, I honestly think. Yeah, a um, lot of Reiner players hate this card. Did you know that? Like a lot of them actively say that's crazy to me. That's very crazy to me. This card is is an overperformer. This card ends games. This card locks in damage. 
like against matchups that would block with maybe a couple cards on your blood rush turn this just says no you don't get to do that for free for free like yeah, it, i'm gonna i'm gonna clip this yeah. and i'm gonna put it on all of my socials because like <laughs> i get an, enough arguments over how pack hunt is cracked but like yeah there's like full block like full posts about how this card is the worst like one of the worst rhino cards it's like Nah, man. Nah, no, man. It's like, <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's so one of our best. This is probably I, our best card, one of them, you know? I, uh, I've had turns where, like, I roll scabs and then I play, like, Smash Instinct Pack Hunt. That's double intimidate with, like, 12 damage. You could do barragings. You, like, it just fixes, it fixes the, like, you, you've got a barraging on your, on you know, they've got one card down. Maybe you Blood Rush, they've got two cards down. This just seals the damage in. Like, it's. Yeah. The intimidate is so valuable on this. Against aggro decks too, right? In that very late stage, you're both at like one, two life, three life, whatever. And you send this in. It's like every time I send this card in, you don't get to pick what you're blocking with. Yeah. The, and I'm doing it off yeah. two cards and you're going to give me two cards every time. And maybe I'm going to keep hitting that one card that you wanted to block with. Like the amount of times people groan when I hit their like final <laughs> D react and they're just like, yeah. what the heck, you know? The, it's hard to quantify the value of the built-in intimidate because you don't usually see what you made them choose. Like yes. you don't know the effect that you're having. Play on the opposite side of Reinar for a while and then see how it's like, oh, I have to take damage here if I want to make my turn work still because they make are forcing me to choose to block with like the cards that I would be playing. And yeah. So like I had Oldhams take six. I had Oldhams take three because they were they like I just hit the right card. Like yep. it's very good. It's very good. Very good. Yeah, I agree. I don't know. I agree. Okay. <laughs> it reinforced the line. Uh, it was this or a waste. Azalea exists. Yeah. I think this was the right choice. I think so too. Um, it works in the Bravo too. Yeah. It's It's got some other niche uses. You can, I think I ended up cutting it against Azuri, but you could run it against Azuri. Yeah. But in the end, I decided that it was too slow to have six defense cards against Azuri, and I just decided to try to play aggressively. Yeah. Um, this card did do very well in Azalea for me. Same. It was kind of shaky in practice, but it it performed this uh, this weekend. Yeah. I had okay. one turn where I I blocked with one, like I did an attack and a reinforce line. He had like fourteen dominate or twelve dominate or something. I wasn't gonna die because I had sigil, but I was still waiting for the. I can't remember what I was gonna kill him with. I think maybe a blood rush, and I was waiting for it. We were like second cycle, and I go attack. Reinforce the line. My plan is to use the sigil, but then I block with crown and just see. Like I'm just gonna, I'm just digging at this point, and yeah. it just happens to be the other reinforce the line, and I fully covered like this twelve dominate triple on hit arrow, and I was like sick. Now sick. I'm like, now I go, now I use that sigil to e strike for seven, and he's at one, and like now I've just won the game. Like yeah. this card, this card does very well into Azalea and sometimes Bravo. In one of my Azalea games, I was like, I hadn't found them yet. And I was like, oh my God, like, please, please give me this card. Like, because when you're at like 10, 15, it's like she can just one shot you. You know what I mean? Like, when you get that yeah. low, she's yeah. just like one god turn away from killing you and without any recourse. And it was like, I found it just in time, like, just in time to be like, I live, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Sigil, you were pretty mad on this card at first. What do you think it's, about Sigil? Now? Well, it's just it's just part of that whole like it ruins my blood rush turns. Like, <laughs> yeah, okay. it, it it ruins my tempo when I have tempo. Uh, it it's a really great card. I love playing Sigil. I love hitting it turn zero, which I did a number of times over the mm -hmm. weekend. I love that it like co covers up some of that damage you take from dominate classes. I love baiting the arsenal with it. If you because like you should never play Sigil until you absolutely need to cycle that card just fyi like if you draw this and you use your other three cards don't use it put it in your arsenal like yep. let people think they're going to command and conquer you and you just yep. heal for three and take three that is my biggest um, tip as well that it lives even if it's doing nothing for turns i'll leave it in my my arsenal for turns I, like i think i did it against the dash the dash was like beating me down like get got the high octane into the maximum velocity i'm trying to fatigue it you know i'm getting low and low and low and this sigil was in my arsenal for probably six turns and i was like i want him to think he's crushing me i want i want my opponent to think yeah. that this card in my arsenal is never gonna leave if he keeps attacking me and then he went for the kill and i sigiled out and then he took too much damage to do that and then i got control back you know what i mean 
Yeah, let okay. your opponent think you're lower than you actually are. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, it's it's a great card, and it, it makes sense with the deck. It's just sometimes it potentially there's matchups. I don't know what matchups we actually take it out, if any. Do you can you recall a sideboard where this is not in? Oh, I think oh. I take it out for Lexi. I take it out it for all aggro decks. Hit. All aggro. Phi Katsu. Uh, Phi Katsu. I take it out. Lexi. I take it out. I'm wishy washy on it in some other matchups, but like I do take it in for rune blades because it and and dash because it gives you like free chip damage back. I don't know, it's kind of weird. I, I've played this deck so long that it, like it a lot of the time it's how I feel, <laughs> you know, like however my, you when look my like opponent somebody flips I need sigil against. yeah, I'm like, mm, you look like a somebody I need a sigil against, you know, like <laughs> I, don't, I don't get it, but yeah, for sure, take it out versus hyper aggro is what I did. Yeah, it yeah. because it will trip you up sometimes. It's yeah. just an it's another if it's, it's like feels particularly bad to draw it on an aggressive turn because yeah. like pitching it is like I just sent three free life, you know, three preemptive block to the bottom of the deck. Um yeah, I, that's why I'm I'm like uh, on it because when I'm kicking ass, this is the worst card in the deck. But when I'm like in a tight matchup, this is the best card in the deck. Yeah, it's the Reinar problem, man, like the problem for everybody at home who doesn't really understand what we're talking about, maybe yet, uh, Reinar operates in two extremes, right? If you find a Blood Rush on turn two or turn three, you're ahead just by the nature of the deck. You know, like you're, you're ahead by like 10 life. But if you haven't found a Blood Rush, you're behind. And so it's kind of like weird where you have to have the deck built in a way where you can absolutely high roll and blow your opponent out of the water, but you have to have a deck that functions if you don't. And it's really it's a weird deck space design issue to kind of like operate in. It's like D reacts and sigils are terrible if you found three blood rushes, but if you haven't found them, they're the best cards in the deck. So it's kind of weird to when we say we're so met on a card. I love sigil, but it has like you know made me mad before. I have <laughs> legit like you know I have legit sink below one to the bottom just because it was like I don't need this right now. You know, yeah. Skull crack. What do you think? <laughs> Meh. <laughs> yeah. It's um, I get it. So I ended up buying a, a playset and putting them in the deck because there's no better off. What What are we gonna? Honestly, what am I gonna choose? It's a It's a two for six, which honestly is what really brought it around for me was yeah. just being a two for six. And that sounds weird, but on your blood rush turns, it's a two for eight after claw claw. So that brings it up to eighteen damage and, and two cost. Way better. Two cost is so, so much easier to cast than three cost. Because mm -hmm. if you draw two reds off your blood rush, you're in trouble if you've got, you know, a smash instinct that you need to fire. Yeah. Um, so two for six is very good. Could be any card that's two for six, honestly. But the fact that it also has this high roll upside of giving you a free resource just makes it so your blood rush, you know, is if you do draw those two reds, you're in a better spot. If you... Yeah. You know, that that can fix the cost curve of playing a three cost attack. Um, it can play around frostbites. It can do a number of things. And so it's it's a really great upside. And two for six is all you need for your blood rushes or just regular whatever trading turns. Two for six is great. Yeah. I mean, it's a meh. Yeah. I mean, like when your red cards in your deck upside is that you hope you discard it. It's kind of a sad feature. Like it's a sad. It's like. <laughs> This is like this is where we are operating as Reinar players. Is like, <laughs> yeah, our power I cards I are better. Them. Yeah, if I discard this red, it is good for me. You know, I mean, it's terrible, right? Yeah. Um, but two for six, I moved a we were this deck's more aggressive than last season, so the number two is the magic number. You need your three card blood rushes to be able to fire in bad scenarios. There was a handful of times the one the one resource was actually very useful. Uh, that's really it. And it has the coolest flavor text of any card made in the game and some of the coolest art uh, ever. But aside from that, it is just like a very sub red card. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're not comparing it to other people's class cards, that's for sure. No, yeah, yeah. you compare this to other classes reds and you're like, what the hell? Uh, 
Arg Smash, one copy. It's amazing. Don't take it out. Every dash player it's cries when you play this card. The best feeling in the world. Yeah. To hit at least a four on an Arg Smash and just win the game instantly. My dash so opponent, good. pounder, uh, item, and then he, like, was really considering. He had a whole un- he had a whole another action point, and he was like looking at his hand, kind of considering what to do. And he plays another item down instead of attacking me. And you could see it in his head. He was like going through. Like, should I do this? Should I not do this? And I'm holding in my hand, Arg Smash <laughs> Blue. <laughs> and then I forget what the other attack is. And he plays the other item. And I just like, this is the best day of my life, you know? And I play it. And I, I crack everything on the board. And then I still attack him. And you can see the utter hope, like, just disappear. Because he took a whole turn off to play an item I cracked in one turn. Mm-hmm. Uh, super good card. It's the most brutish card we get to play that's still decent, you know. Uh, da- Dash is always around. She just she won the calling. Yeah. When no one had Dash on their radar, so like one slot in your deck to just obliterate dashes is a great rate. Like just yeah. put it in your deck list. Just put it in your deck list, and it's fun to play on top of it being really good. Uh, and then like I actually, go ahead. I included it against Kano as well. Yes. He, get rid of he got three. Numbers. He got three epots down. Unfortunately, I never saw it, but it would have been amazing to destroy one or two epots. I've done it. And like the look on their face, too, because you do it and you're like, I'm about to destroy all of your stuff. Do you want to go off right now when you still have cards in your hand? And you can see yeah. them like, oh, <laughs> you know, like, should I just pop it? Right. At yeah. the very least, they should pop it in Kano. Just like just to see. Gonna, yeah. But then you, know, you roll like, the one and they wasted them. Yeah, you can get deja vu potions too. Like, there's a couple targets, and then if you're if you know your opponent's royal for some reason, you can just flick the gold off the table, which is kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, remembrance. I mean, this card should probably be banned, but uh, it's really good because we can blood rush and get alpha rampages back in long matchups. Gosh, the most important card in the deck against old him. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I mean you kill you kill all them sometimes, like pretty frequently without having to use this, yeah. but using this just makes it like a breeze. Not exactly a breeze, but like you are feeling comfortable that you have win conditions all the way through the match. You You're can like, lose any, your so go ahead, sorry. Uh just just at any point like you play one, you play two, usually about after you play two is when you hope to see it, and then you put you could put both of them back in if your mm-hmm. your deck is still pretty hefty, and then that feeling of comfort is so crazy when you're like, I've played two blood rushes and I have three left. Like yeah. uh, this guy is in the hole right now, basically. I also use it as like a, cause Oldham is still not a free matchup a lot of the time because they have weird cards that just show up on the wrong turn. Endless winter. They have like pummel C and C they have all this bullshit. Right. Um, so the way I look at you, this card is actually firing my blood rushes with as little setup as possible. So I can go get them back as fast as possible. So I like to pull the tempo of the game entirely to my side of the table. And if that means that I'm firing a three card, no pocket blood rush off of yellow, I'm doing it. Cause I'm going to send 10. I'm going to send 12. I'm going to do a double intimidate. I'm going to do whatever I can. And I'm just going to keep digging. And even if it was like two bad blood rushes because I rushed them in a pretty decent one and then I go get three back or I get two more back in an alpha rampage, then I know that I have all the tempo. And then I know that if I set up like one more good blood rush and an alpha rampage, I win. So I, mm-hmm. I use it to like kind of eat through their shield, their frostbites, their, their kind of aggressive turns. And I try and force them to block way faster than they want to. Instead of like trying to set up three perfect blood rushes and then make two more, I'll send five really bad ones. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, that's very valuable keeping keeping them off of attacking you because like guardian above most other classes can just do the thing where I mean every card they have is like eight power, right? It's like six power to eight power, usually eight, or like there could be a pummel. Or it's, you know, an effect you really don't want to see. And so, like, they could, as soon as they start attacking and they draw the next four cards, it could just be, like, six turns before they finally just send uh, something that's just vanilla damage. And you're like, maybe I can pivot here. 
So, so like, yeah, keeping them blocking is very valuable. I got hit with like an absurd amount of endless winters on day two. So many endless winters. They're did, all tech it, for Ranger right now, right? Yeah, and like they don't have to be fused. It's like I have Blood Rush, but I don't have like I'm not flush with resources, and I can't get Tunic because it's gonna make a frostbite, and each claw is gonna make a frostbite. Like, yeah, yeah you want to be on the offensive as often as possible. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. And more than any other matchup, right? Like they can just accidentally beat you. Yeah, I, oh, like yeah, I mean, like maybe not more than you know, like Briars up there and Lexi's up there with accidentally beating you, but like. I swear there was a couple of games early on where I was like really trying to win. I'm getting competitive. I'm making this list. And then I'm like, I'm going to, I have to set up a perfect blood rush. So I'm going to just arsenal this thing here. I'm going to hold this card back. And then it's like tear asunder, whatever pummel. Then it's like, you know, CNC pummel. Then it's spinal crush into whatever. Then it's tear asunder again. And you're like, wow, I just lost the game in five fucking turns. Because yeah. I took one turn off to set up a perfect blood rush. So now I just send them. I'm like, if this is 12, it's 12, whatever, you know, <laughs> like mm -hmm. show me the, show me the ice react because we're going in, you know? Um, and then Tom of Fiendal. we went down to one. I was at one. Then I went to two. Then I went back down to one. Uh, what do you think on this card? I think I only played it against the Kano. I mean, I put it in my list. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time I, discarded it to like a pummel or a discard effect and yeah. or pitched it like it's hard like my arsenal i played a lot of very tight matchups in the calling and my arsenal is constantly having premium cards in it and like sometimes a lot of times home just shows up when you're like it's i need to go now i can't hold this card and put it in my arsenal and then also i have to i'm like forced to hit the multiple action points to make this card good yeah um in yeah, my gambler's gloves were breaking really fast in a lot of my matches. Yeah. Um, it's a great card, and I believe in its high roll potential. But I also just, like, I could totally live without it and not miss it. I, I really liked it in the Kano matchup. Healing for four was important, but yeah. every other matchup, I was like, I don't need this card. Yeah, I think last season I was much higher on it. And then this season I'm definitely lower on it. Like, there's a couple times, like you said, there's a couple times where... Like I, I, there was a game against an old him where I like had my whole ass four card hand and then I tunicked it and I healed for six and then I did like this massive turn and it was disgusting. But then like more often than not this season, I was like, I don't want this card in my hand. It's like a two block yellow that's not doing anything for me because I have a swing big in my arsenal. I'm not about to send a naked swing big because I know blood rush is coming. It's like, you know, what do you do? Uh, and then the last thing you want to do is like pitch it because if that shows up second cycle, you're just you're you're another bad blood rush away from dying or not enough sixes. So I'm actually meh on this this time. Mm. Yeah, when I, it works. It's I, sick. It is sick. So there was one particular I remember I played it from hand because I rolled a six on accident. Um, I, yeah. it was a bad hand. It was like Savage Feast and three non attacks, like a blue, this, and something else, maybe a barraging. And I, I just like rolled scabs just to see what we can make happen. And I hit the six and I go, let's pitch this blue and see what's on the other side of Tom of all. It's a blood rush bellow. Uh, then I played like a, a against one of my old hymns, like a 25 damage blood rush bellow on accident because I still had two action points after. So I blood rush. And then I savage feasted, and then it, like the whole thing went off. But I can't plan on that always happening, right? <laughs> I, yeah, it, the, that just happened to like line up. I wouldn't put it in. I wouldn't continue running it for that reason. Yeah, but, a like, few times you get this a fire yeah. on a blood rush bellows turn is disgusting. Yeah, just like unlimited resources and attacks, and just, and you heal. Yeah, yeah. Like, that is yeah. Adding four healing to your twenty something damage blood rush is very nice. <laughs> like. Um, but that's also asking to have it in Arsenal and draw Blood Rush and land, uh, you know, a four on your roll. Yeah. And so it's like you're that's asking for a lot and a it's lot. a two block. Okay. I mean, that was the last card. So I guess final questions would be what were your low performers or most more, most likely to be swapped out? Uh, definitely the Tome, the final, the... Like, I don't know what I would swap is kind of the issue is like, this is why I was comfortable landing here was because like the, we explored many, many options. 
pommels didn't feel very good. No other attacks felt very good. This is probably, mm -hmm. if I was going to continue playing Reinar, this is probably where I would end up and just keep playing this and cut the tome and maybe fit some other tech card in. Yeah. Um, but like the like the humble is probably the weakest card I see here besides the tome, yeah. and I don't know what I'd cut it for. It's still the logic is still there. Like it can get you into a position where you, you know, you you mess up Alexi's turn or or you turn off somebody's. It's useful against other heroes in some scenarios. So I'd probably cut the tome and put the third humble back in because I cut a humble for the AB three. That makes sense. Um, so like that would probably be my swap, and that's about it. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd put AB two back in because I shouldn't have won one of my Icelander games. It was just the fact that they didn't draw an attack or an arcane spell. I think I would cut Sand Sketch Plan because I'm still pretty sure I have a zero percent fire rate, and I legit fired Pack Hunt several times. I could get behind that. The the one thing I worried about with Pat, blue pack hunt is that, you know, when you draw those hands where you have like two of the blue cards and you just need to filter them out to play a blood rush or a discard effect, That's true. having multiple pack hunts is very, very bad. But you can't filter a sand sketch plan either. You can play it if your whole hand is sixes, though. It's like, On a blood I don't turn, know. Are you going to do that? I don't know. Man. I don't know. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. The pack, I'm sure the pack hunts are fine. I mean, yeah, I get it. I like, like I said, I like pack hunt. I, I don't know. I don't know either. Too. I mean, it's not. There's no. There's no better. That's the problem with Reinar. Everybody here, right? Uh, there's no better blue cards, and there's no better yellow cards, <laughs> and this is our life. And then even our red cards. Like looking at this list, I know there's a problem with the attack balancing because there's several games where I'm like, I don't know what to put in. Either Enlightened Strike or Skullcrack. I'm not really sure which one of these pack hunts to take out. You know, there's definitely a balance problem on the attack side, but there aren't very many other reds to pick from. Yeah. I the pack hunts, the skull cracks, and the E strikes definitely collide in a certain space. But I felt yeah. pretty comfortable by the end that pack hunt comes out against your aggressive matchups. Yep. Because you don't need that intimidate for the most part, and but skull crack and e strike help you high roll or like exactly. get you into better positions. Yeah, so I felt I, I felt good yeah. with that choice. Same. Yeah, humble skull crack or enlightened strike and command and conquer would all go in versus like Lexi. Just because, you know, it was like I need all of these high roll cards. Shove them all in the list. Mm. All right. Okay. And then I guess one final question over performers before we take off. What card or cards, in your opinion, were your all-stars of the weekend? Man. Scroll up. Yeah, it's probably from the main deck, honestly. I think it's got to be Savage Feast. I think so, too. I think it's Savage Feast. Savage Feast is what... And anytime I suddenly blew up an opponent, it was Savage Feast's fault. <laughs> yeah like the the third lexi i played in like round seven uh i he start i started the turn with three frostbites and i blood rushed him for like 26 damage <laughs> I, like he he just he, he fused a he fused a blizzard bolt and then hit me with two more attacks and i was like I was sitting on two blues. I have a blood rush and arsenal and then like two sixes one six was a uh, beast within and the other one was savage feast I, you know, pay to roll scabs. I hit the action points I need. I send the blood rush. He rolls for the card and he picks the blood. He picks the sat or the yeah, the beast of in. Yeah, the beast of in. And I draw like a yellow and a blue. It's nuts. And then I do the savage feast and draw another card. And it was just like the damage was crazy. He went for I think he just died. He was at like 17 <laughs> or 20. He literally just died. Like we were in the middle of the match. Yeah, <laughs> and it did so much and intimidated so much that he even blocking with armor just died on the spot. Yeah, Savage yeah. Feast is truly savage. It will just win you games. Yeah, I mean the one intimidate matters too when you're going wide for twenty. You know what I mean? Like the same thing with Blood Rush. There's a reason that Leviathan's Blood Rushes are less threatening. I mean they're technically more threatening, but they're less threatening than Reinar's because we take a whole ass card out of your hand. Right. Yeah. Which means you, yeah, you just lose three life in a turn that you, you wish you had more life. You know. 
you can kind of consider it dealing three damage, right? Basically, yeah. It's like dealing true damage. It's 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 still threatening the same amount, but because they don't have the option to block, you actually just dealt more damage. Yeah. Yeah, I would say Savage Feast for sure. I mean, obviously Swing Big and obviously Blood Rush are like the three cards in this deck right now that make it viable. And maybe you know, like a little sprinkle of Beast Within and Reckless Swing because Reckless Swing is still my yeah. favorite card ever made. But oh, last question, I promise. Okay. Did you get Reckless Swing kills? Because if you uh, did, you should have had them signed. You should have. I I don't think I killed a single person. In I didn't kill Reckless anybody. Swing. This was bullshit. Yeah, honestly, uh, honestly, the Super person. Armory, the Super Armory on Friday, I killed an Icelander with Reckless Swing. Oh my. Which is pretty cool, <laughs> but nobody in, nobody in the calling. This is my first ever event not killing somebody with a reckless swing. It was crazy how much it wasn't like I I just like overkilled my opponents constantly. I did it wasn't ever in that spot where I was like, please, I need I need this to get out of the game. Like I that's against the Azalea where I hit the double reinforced line. I I think I was looking for it because he was he was at like one. And I was like, I, I had just pitched one, but I knew I did one earlier. So I was like, maybe two or three turns. And then I just accidentally did like E strike into swing big and he died. Like I yeah, just couldn't, I couldn't kill my opponents with, with reckless I kept swing. getting them to like two and I was like, absolutely pause <laughs> time, you know? And then exa- I think the deck is faster than it used to. This, this might just be a better version of the list than last season. I'm not sure. I mean, playing in a five was a little different, but. It maybe is a good sign that we're killing our opponents instead of reckless swinging them. Instead of desperately trying desperately to hope they don't like run you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Like just trying to hold on for my last, my last reckless swing <laughs> card. Okay. Well, thanks for coming on, Justin. It of was course. really cool to actually have a training partner, a testing partner on Reinar for the first time in my life. Uh, and I think we had yeah. really good success with it in a meta that, he shouldn't be good in right so i think i think I yeah think you did a very I, good job too i mean we, we worked off of your core and you put up the results last season i i do feel like i contributed a little bit like i really was on board with the e-strikes yeah this is your point. and yeah. and you know i helped explore a couple of options but this is mostly your brainchild and i i, I believed in your list and that's why i'm here playing reinar of all things yeah he's one of the people who would always be like you shouldn't do that anymore <laughs> 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 all right man well thanks for coming on uh congrats on your performance uh no, it was you. rough at the end but you know this is your first always... time ever playing this list you know I, I, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, I slowly, I need to get away from the event to really like appreciate that. But cause I will always be very hard on, I expect a lot for myself at, with how much I play and practice. And so it's always disappointing to like not get there, but you know, I, the 33rd out of 900 people, I, I do really good. appreciate that. That on number, Reinar. So. Yeah. You beat seven I, people the first day with Reinar, which is hilarious. I know. Crazy. And some of those wins were so nuts too just looking for those outs it, it was a fun it was fun a fun day to play this like surprise hero like a lot of people kind of sh- like went what are you what's on the table in front of me yeah so that that added a lot of fun to it it definitely yeah definitely helps when you flip your hair and they're like your opponent's like oh i got this and then you're like no you don't dude yeah you, you don't even <laughs> no, know you what's don't. happening on this side of the table buddy yeah <laughs> sorry are you excited because i got excited when i saw your hero you know what i mean all mm-hmm. right, man. Well, thanks for coming on. Thanks for all the help testing. This was a lot of fun. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.